Hey, you're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. My name is Sean Wilkie, and we're back for another exciting episode. Ivan, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and today's guest? Yeah, so my name is Ivan Zach. I am an ex, or always, I guess, veterinarian, and um, going to do a little bit of technology right now. And um, we are meeting today with uh, Dr. Etienne Patem, who was uh, my uh, professor of cardiology in the Atlantic Veterinary College. And um, so currently, and since then, I guess, and before then, he works as an associate professor of cardiology uh, in the companion animal department of the University of Prince Edward's Island, Atlantic Veterinary College. Uh, he holds two um, board degrees from in internal medicine and cardiology. From what I know, Etienne did his uh, uh, residence with Steve Ettinger, <laughs> who uh, basically is sort of like, he invented cardiology from what I understand. <laughs> um, and um, <clears throat> among uh, various articles, chapters in the books, which is another one that when I was in school was published, the uh, book of internal medicine with a, a co-author with uh, uh, Steve Ettinger. It was a four, I don't remember what number edition that was, uh, that you had a chapter in. When you were a student, Ivan? Yeah, that was long. Probably the sixth. Six, yeah. yeah. And, then, uh, and then as I graduated, I think the next year, the veterinary author of Veterinary Advisor, uh, which was then uh, became the Bible of every emergency uh, hospital I worked in, uh, replacing, I think I can say that, replacing five-minute consults, and then also extending into various directions of medicine, innovation, research. One of them that I was familiar with also was the uh, application for both Android and, and iOS, the drug formulary with the company Timeless Vet uh, that is on PI. And I can't name every single aspect of your career because there's too many and I don't think that we summarize them all here, but you've, you've done something out uh, from personal side of things. You, you own two Newfoundland dogs. Is it still two? Right? Uh, we're, I mean, we're down to one, but that's um, the story of life itself. Eh? Okay, so I have it not updated. I apologize. And from co- hobbies, you have cleaning up dog hair and drool, travel right. languages, running, hiking, <clears throat> snowshoeing, and shot a can karate. That's true. So the first question that we have for you is, how does the shot a can karate difference from other karate styles? So what is this, a quiz or something? <laughs> uh, oh, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for this invitation. The different styles involve different moves or different ways of proceeding and sometimes different philosophies. I think Shotokan is like probably the most widespread. So it's what we think of when we typically think of karate. That's about as much as I think I can explain because the rest is, is just doing it. That's cool. So a follow-on question, which is a little, a little silly, but what have you learned in karate that's been translatable to your career? You know, that is an absolutely fabulous question. And I, I, I wish I had asked you to ask it because it's it's surprising how helpful it is so the single most useful thing i've learned in karate is that if you try and stand in the way of somebody who is trying to harm you then you will get hurt but if you move aside and let their momentum carry them sailing past you you won't it's pretty interesting i'll remember that next time that my cfo is in the office give me Okay. I think that the, the topic and the reason why we wanted to invite you is that I'm, I was truly fascinated with, with several things throughout your career. The one Sean asked me, we just had lunch and he asked me, he said, what is, what is the most memorable time for you with Etienne in, in, in the vet school? And it was obviously it was our rotation in Korea. I think you still remember that. I think that, you know, I can name both your rotation mates and it was one of my favorite rotations of all time. I think, I think he's still traumatized from it. <laughs> But, but I do think that I learned a lot. So, so the most memorable uh, episode from my interaction with Ken in the vet school was during the rotation. And, and I remember that not only he taught us how to recognize a certain condition, you know, diagnose and treat it, it was also an angle from the client perspective. How do you deliver these terrible news to the clients? So it was actually a huge impact on me uh, because as I progress in, in the career as a veterinarian and beyond, a lot of the things are not... You know, you, you took the approach of not just looking at it from the academic perspective, but how, how how does that interact with any other aspect of life? So that was very interesting. That's the example I gave to, to Sean. What we wanted to dig into during this conversation is 
Uh, some people may perceive academia and academic advancements as not very entrepreneurial. It's like you lock yourself in that environment. And I think you're a true inspiration for anybody who wants to pursue that career and add things to it. So the academia and entrepreneurship combination is sort of the topic for this. So I wanted to ask you, how do you get inspired to either advance in your academic achievements and how do you combine it with technology? Well, thanks. I mean, that's a, that's a huge uh, open canvas. I often think that other people have expressed things better than I possibly could. So I, I like quotations and two that come to my mind that happen to be from entrepreneurs, but I think are, are just kind of broader than just enterprise. One is Henry Ford. Uh, Henry Ford famously said, the secret to success is to understand the point of view of others. And to think that somebody would say after all of, you know, the, the groundbreaking things that he did, I think is really interesting. That has absolutely held true. So when you were talking about delivering news that's really unpleasant, even devastating. I, I've always, I feel like I've always done that, or at least I try and do that now in a way that realizes that I might be on the receiving end of that. And I think when we do that, people respect it, even though it's not what they want to hear. I think that holds true in pretty much any walk of life. I try and live by that. The other quote that comes to mind is a Steve Jobs quote. So Steve Jobs famously said, and I'm going to have to pronounce this properly because the last letter in the last word I'm going to say is the letter P, like Paul. So he said, real artists ship. Um, I said this thinking it was a brilliant quote one time and somebody misunderstood the last word as something else. That I, I'm not really sure <laughs> what the meaning was of the alternative thing. But anyway, so what I'm getting at, uh, or at least what I think you know, is the message behind that, is that it's an incredibly fortunate position to be in academia, to have a moment to think and to try and get to deeper levels of what we see day to day. I spent my first 10 years of veterinarian in private practice. That means high volume, seeing lots of things day to day, but not a whole lot of time necessarily to think of the why. And since being at the University of Prince Edward Island, just being in an academic setting, part of my job is to have sort of a, a moment to think of maybe uh, causes or, or underlying reasons or whatnot. And I, I think we have to be careful not to fall prey to, to have that turn to navel gazing. And so to me, real artists do ship their stuff. And so uh, that means staying productive and having what you think is great, what I think is great, challenged, you know, in the public sphere. So that's what I've tried to do. Yeah, so, so cool. That's really interesting. I love those quotes, by the way. You know, a little variation on the first one is seek to understand, then be understood, which I really like as well. Uh, so very well aligned. I think one of the things that really is interesting for me is like, what have some of the lowest points been in your academic career? And then what are some of the highest points, you know? <laughs> They've had a whole had a bunch of time. So interested to hear, you know, or, or even just your career in general. Well, I mean, thank you. I mean, it's an honor to, to be asked for the lowest points. You know, if we have two, three hours, I can go through them in detail. But all kidding aside, I mean, look, this is a terrible pun, but I'm, I'm a cardiologist. So blood goes in, blood goes out. Like every systole has a diastole. So you can't pretend that, at least I can't pretend that, you know, everything's always rosy. So when I think of, you know, the first time I was editor of the Clinical Veterinary Advisor, which is a textbook that seems to be very popular, the first time I, despite all of my careful planning, there were, from memory, about 310 authors, and I mistakenly submitted the same topic to be written up to three different authors. And so, like, that doesn't sound like a big deal. But for somebody to be willing to dedicate, like these are experts, and for somebody to be willing to dedicate not just a five-minute phone call to you, but an entire day or days of work to create an original chapter that they are dedicating to your book, and you now have to say, you know what, actually, I accidentally asked for this from somebody else. Sorry, that is a stomach-turning kind of situation, and it still turns me, turns me inside out remembering the realization of stuff like that. On a day-to-day -day thing, I just came to this from treating a patient who's in ICU now who's doing poorly. So despite everything that I'm doing with two family members who love this companion because this dog means something special to them that no other living creature means, and I'm not helping that dog. Now, I don't know of any other way to do better for this dog because the dog is, is severely ill. But those are undeniable low moments. So I think you know, this, is, this gets back to this idea of failure versus defeat. 
You know, I mean, if you fail, then at least you can sort of try and figure out why did that happen? And I think that is extraordinarily hard. It took me a long time to be able to see it that way. But at least there's a chance to say, okay, you know, now what? As opposed to defeat, that just leaves you feeling annihilated. So I don't have a secret answer, but I, I know that I've lived all of those things that I've just said, and they haven't felt good. And, and here we are. Wow. That's, uh, before you answer that, I, I'm just thinking like in that situation, uh, what would I do? I think, I think that uh, if I would submit three authors, I would say to two of them, you didn't win. It was a competition. <laughs> <laughs> it was a challenge and you guys didn't pass it. <laughs> wow, that would be a hard one to handle. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that's great. I think that uh, what you're describing is sort of, you know, life kind of helps you to get through the through the situations and then and then kind of shapes you for the for the next round i think that's what i felt a lot with the technology and with uh, sort of entrepreneurship in general if i can ask you how how was the whole experience in getting into uh, the timeless vet and deciding to create a product out of the knowledge and then thinking that there's an application to that and then how uh, how easy it was to actually create into it I, I also want to quote some, I don't remember who it was, but I think it was a professor from MIT visiting Russia. And they, they were talking about the reasons why, why a lot of innovations didn't become products in, in the Soviet Union. And they said that it's one thing to invent something and the other thing is to innovate. And I think that the difference that they find is that the invention is come up with something that works. The innovation is to take that and get wide adoption of it. Hmm. what was that experience like and how did you come up with the whole concept of the of the drug application and uh, yeah what was the experience like with the sort of technology and yeah so that was really neat the app uh, the veterinary drug index it still exists it's for uh, android and and iphones and, and tablets and whatnot and uh, you know i think it was a co just a combination of a bunch of things. Like, you know, we think of the perfect storm as being bad things, but sometimes it's a perfect storm of really good things that happen to come together. And in this case, it was, we had some raw material because my uh, former boss, Steve Ettinger, had created material for um, a publication that's long since out of print that involved drug information. And so I thought, well, gee, that's, that's kind of nice. And at the same time, I was approached by the folks from Timeless asking, do you know of somebody who would like to create basically a resource that was unique and that could, I knew, build on the stuff that Steve Ettinger had? So it was that confluence. It was really just um, being in the right place at the right time. And so I think what I really liked was being a startup, the Timeless group was very open to crafting this like as something that would be the dream product from like my perspective and Steve's perspective and Wayne Schwartz's perspective. It's funny, Ivan, a similar situation you and I are in right now was when I contacted my former pharmacology professor, Wayne Schwartz, and asked him if he wanted to be part of this Fed Drug Index. And the next thing I knew, you know, this person who, to me, previously had, you know, kind of walked on the water. It was now kind of somebody I was going back and forth with and figuring stuff out and, and kind of building and, and seeing stuff grow out of it. So uh, the Vet Drug Index was a combination of interest on the, the part of people who could make it happen, which was the Timeless Group, and of people who could make the content happen, which was my professor, my boss, and me. And uh, and, and I think just fun. I mean, it was the, the pleasure of creating something new. I'm guessing that you would know this many thousand fold over from creating SmartFlow. I mean, you have this idea and it suddenly comes, you come to realize that this thing has legs, like this can actually work. That's a very, very intoxicating feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Intoxicating is a, is a great way to put it because it, there's highs and lows, you know, with entrepreneurship and academia as well. And one question that I couldn't help but want to ask is parallels or differences between academia and entrepreneurship. Where are they the same? Where are they completely different? Seeing how you've lived on both sides of the line. To me, entrepreneurship is a very kind of, is a term that can be interpreted many different ways. Some people, I think, think of it as it's a way to make money. And I, I guess I don't consider that, that that's, you know, my perspective or philosophy. Uh, some people consider it more as innovation and dissemination, I think is what you're getting at, Ivan. And I like that because 
to speak to your, your the question that you just asked, um, the similarities between academia and entrepreneurship, I think, are the interest in thinking outside the box, the interest in asking questions and exploring. And I would say also in, in sharing, you know, in, in having, feeling a mission or an almost a, um, yeah, a passion for what we're doing. I think that's shared by successful academicians and successful entrepreneurs. And so the differences, I mean, I think the differences are, are maybe almost stereotypical that, you know, academia is maybe can drift towards intellectual pursuits that don't necessarily have immediately apparent applications. Although you could argue that Google's, you know, Project X and these like moonshot types of projects also are not necessarily applicable. So maybe the line is not as, as clearly defined as, as the stereotype would have it. That's very interesting. When you mentioned the shared vision and um, so one of, one of the passions so I, that I had in the last, uh, the end of smart flow, well, Smartflow is not over. Smartflow is living in another. But the, the last couple of years in Smartflow, I shifted more towards a sort of leadership and vision setting and the culture of the organizations. And when I when I joined IDEX, um, th that's what I was passionate about establishing in their software division. So basically instilling into the existing organization the vision and then aligning everybody around those vision mission, then creating core values and adding goals that execute on that vision and i think that that is the the similarity it's just that it's not as structured in academia i think mm -hmm. you have an idea or hypothesis that you're trying to uh, to prove with certain research and then when you get there it's sort of the celebration of success is similar but i think it's almost more honest than in some i mean if you think about true entrepreneurs, I think that no one does it for money. None successful entrepreneurs do it for money. I think a lot of a lot of us start to do it for money. You know, my, my first company that I started, I moved to rural Nova Scotia after spending all the money that I had made and living in Europe for a couple of months and running out of money. Ended up in my mother's spare room, and uh, and I thought to myself, I really like living here. That was the company. No, no, I, did, I didn't exit. This, I, yeah, what, what happened is I had a job in the, in the west of Canada, and made a bunch of money and decided to move to Europe and travel around. It was great, but I ran out of money and I came home to Nova Scotia. And 20 years ago, you know, you could live here with no money um, in your mother's basement suite. And it was great, you know. However, I needed something to do and I didn't want to do like everybody else. I knew I didn't want to run off and live in Alberta. And so I knew I had to create my own opportunities. And so I started in business for myself at a really young age. I think it was 21 when I started my first company. And so I, I did it for money, but then I really quickly realized that that wasn't going to work. I, I did it with something that I was passionate about. It was IT and technology and it was fun. But then what happens to you as a business leader, and I'm sure there's parallels as well, especially when you start to lead things, you end up not doing the thing that you started to do. And I know that you can relate to this because you just said it. You know, I started in business to fix computers and work with technology and I ended up managing a, a P&L and a bunch of people and I had no idea how to do it. And that's when I flipped. I flipped from doing it for money to doing it because I love to develop the people around me. And that's why I'm still doing it. You know, I, I can't stop and I'm looking for the next thing just like you because we want to make people all they can be of themselves and it's for me there's nothing else more exciting and i'd be interested to hear you kind of comment on that kind of knowing that you've lived in both of these worlds so i i think if i'm capturing the flavor of what you said in terms of of people and pleasure and and the rewards of working with folks and the frustrations and difficulties and all the rest of it like that whole kaleidoscope i think what I've come away with is a feeling that if the fit isn't good, that's not necessarily somebody else's fault or mine. I mean, I, I used to, I think, take it quite personally, like the authors I was talking about, you know, if I, if I made a mistake, that was one thing. But there are plenty of other situations that maybe involve some tension or friction or whatever. And it's just like, well, you know, maybe this wasn't the right time for these people, or maybe what I think is, challenging or disagreeing with me is just this person's way of being. And so I think along the lines, but not the same as, as what you just said, I feel like I've forgiven people a little bit for being human and, and maybe in that process, forgiven myself as well a little bit more than, than I might have before. And uh, 
that's nice. <laughs> that, that, that makes the days go by better. <laughs> so funny. It makes me think I had a, I had tea with my great aunt. She's 94, still drives her own car, does everything for herself. And I said, I said, you know, does it, does the world become kind of easy to understand as you, as you age and as you get more experience? And she said, no, dear, you just get better at accepting the things that you don't understand. <laughs> oh, nice. Hey, wonderful. Nice. Yeah. Nice. yeah. I, I was frustrated when she told me, but then I was like, hey, good to know now, as opposed to it's waiting. It's a gentle way of her calling you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to tell her that. <laughs> so I, I really like what you said about the empowering people. And I think what, what, is, what is the better way to empower people than teaching them in the vet school? I mean, how is that experience? And do you ever feel, I always look at, I have a six-year-old son now, and he graduated from the first grade, which is a completely different experience, which I'm failing at, I think, as a parent. But, but he, he, he just finished the first grade, and I'm looking at the teachers, and I'm thinking, how do they feel? Like, they just spent the entire year with these kids, mm-hmm. and now they're, well, next year he'll come to the same school. But when you, when you have these students graduate, and it's every year, I guess, a new class, how do you feel about it? Do you feel like you're separating with people? Because it's like repeated experience over and over. What is that whole experience Partying with people that you just infuse with the knowledge and releasing from from your hands to the world. You know, (laughs) yeah, I mean, I certainly wasn't prepared for that. And I don't don't know that there's any like formal preparation for that. I think what you said is so true. And I've been surprised at, I guess I've, I've been at this a while now, so that sometimes former students will loop back and tell me, as you did at the beginning of the this podcast, about things that that influenced them. Sometimes people say, you know, oh, you, you, you said this and I never forgot it. And I think, wow, I forgot it. Uh, <laughs> it was, you know, it's like I, I didn't realize I was being memorable. And then other times there's stuff that I feel like I said six times and it's still not sinking in. And so what I've come to realize is that maybe me or, or maybe to some degree, all of us aren't necessarily like as accurate as we might think at interpreting the impact that we think we're having. I certainly am not. The things that apparently stick with people are often not the ones that I meant to be sticky. So realizing that makes it a little bit easier, like when I'm teaching, to feel like, this is what I've got. You know, I know this can be helpful to you, but maybe it's not the right time for you, or maybe you understand it intellectually, but not viscerally. Maybe it'll only come to you later. And so let me offer you, like, here's, here's what I've got. And then go forth. I can't, I can't force feed it to you. So feeling like I did what I could and then good luck to you. That's really how I've come to, to terms with it. I will say that now that like the years have become many years, I find myself sometimes battling this feeling of like, like I've been at the Atlantic Vet College for 16 years. And so I teach much the same thing year in and year out. So sometimes I find myself thinking, how is it that you don't know this? I've told you 16 times, but I haven't. I've just told each class once, and it's this particular That's student's awesome. first time hearing it. Right? So <laughs> I, have to, I have to like rein in the frustration a little bit and realize, like, wait a minute. You know, this is the whole thing of Henry Ford, seeing it from the perspective of the person I'm speaking to, not just what I feel like saying. And so when I think of it that way, then it helps a little, but I still feel like, holy moly, it's so clear. And of course, it can only be clear after you've had to say it 16 times i can totally relate to that as, <laughs> as you know talking to somebody and being thinking to myself i've told you this i don't even know how many times i've never told them you know right. I've told all these other people around me and you know never never told that individual but you know you just when you say something so often you know that's repeatable and you know you just think to yourself like how how can this not be common sense to you but you you know it inside and out. So well, can I then maybe do a little feed on that? So with so many different personalities, I, I think you have a pretty good selection process because I think that the the folks that are getting into vet school, I, I think they're defined as smart to a certain level. Yeah, I mean, certainly more than you know, fifteen years ago when they you know. Would... <laughs> yeah, he, he anybody... had to, he had to do it twice. <laughs> <laughs> so because it was my second round, right? The first one was in Ukraine. The second one. I don't know. 
this is my, my joke is falling flat. I'm sorry. <laughs> but no, but, but, but what I, you know, I, another experience with my son, I went, uh, mm. he goes to the guitar class and then, so he went and I never visited with him. He always goes in and you pick him up. So I decided to go in, in the classroom with him. It's one on one mm. with the teacher. So I went in and I just wanted to know, cause he wouldn't play for me at home. So I'm like, what does it look like? And it, it just like, the guy was, I don't know what he does, but basically I would be frustrated in 30 seconds. It's like, okay. <laughs> and he goes, okay, so try the second string. And he tries it and he's like, wait, that can go up a little bit. He goes down. He's like, okay, now let's do it a little more up and he's more down. And then he's like playing with a wrong string. And I just, if I had hair, I would start playing it. And as we are leading, I'm like, thank you. I don't understand how you do this job. So, so how do you deal, I mean, with the students that just don't get it? Do you get frustrated? Do you have like a punch bag and do karate at home? Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I have, the, I have the punching bag in the back room. Excuse me, I have to step out for a minute. And then you hear these ungodly noises. Punch the bag, <laughs> smoke a cigarette, go back. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like this. This is the truth. When I went through veterinary school, I didn't get it. I went through year one and year two of vet school, not, and even a big chunk of year three, just not getting it. It seemed like it was just cram and regurgitate. It was like undergrad all over again. And I, I didn't buy it. So I did poorly in my first couple of years. And as a consequence, I graduated not well-placed in my class. It was a very humbling moment to realize when I asked for my grades uh, that they were just not good. And I think in the end, that has been a great help because I know that other students can be in that same situation that I am. They don't have the same learning style as my teaching style. They're ready for things that I haven't even thought to give them yet and not ready for stuff that I am ready to give them. And so I think realizing that, like it'd be a little hard at first. I mean, it's easy to just say, well, forget it. You know, if you're not ready, then why do I even bother? But I think also the way out is to say, it's okay that what I want to teach you is maybe not necessarily what you want to learn. And we all have examples of that. I mean, just because I'm interested in providing information doesn't mean that the person I'm speaking to is willing to receive it. So that's not too um, fancy, I don't think. It's just, just part of growing up. Yeah, it's interesting. One of the things that I kind of was thinking, you know, here's this person that's taught hundreds of veterinarians that are all over. Do you have any like secret teaching skills to get people to question things or to think more innovatively? Have you come up with any approaches that may be directly related to, you know, to business, to people that are running a veterinary practice, to people that are trying to solve difficult issues? Mm -hmm. Has there been any kind of resources or methods that you've used or stumbled upon that are kind of your go-tos? I think yes and no. Chris Rocchio uh, famously was asked for advice and he said, uh, the only advice I can say is what Mark Twain said, which is never take advice from people like me. And so <laughs> I think I use that, like I think of that for how I used to try so hard to impart, like it gets back to this thing of, I have something to give, so I want to give it to you. Well, the underlying message of that is you're missing something, you know, you need me to give it to you. And that's not really a very good message. So instead, what I've discovered is that a lot of time that I used to spend talking, I maybe should be listening. And that if somebody says something that is, I think, wrong or in a way I disagree with, maybe it is wrong. But maybe it turns out that it's just said in a way that wasn't in the same mindset that I was at. So, yeah, for me personally, it's just listen more. Not, it doesn't mean be a doormat. You know, it doesn't mean don't have a vision for your own. But I think anybody who inherently has that kind of vision for doing something uh, has the risk of steamrollering what turns out to be you know the the next level of their enterprise or their their mission that just happen to express themselves differently or look differently or sound differently or whatever and and we're all learning that that doesn't work i think these days it's interesting i'm, I'm just what's rolling in my head is how does how does that map to uh, the, the, the teaching and to business and what i keep thinking is it's sort of like you're looking for your product market fit and not everybody wants your product so mm -hmm. when you're thinking in marketing 
you're thinking, okay, if I'm creating this product, it's for everybody. I made this app, it's for everybody. And then in reality, when you start hitting the actual customer, you realize that not all customers want this or they want it in different shape or in different forms. So instead of forcing it onto the entire market and business, you narrow it down to a certain audience that will accept it as it is. And then that's your audience and you pitch it to them. So almost it sounds like that in academia, you do your best what you can, but some people just don't get it maybe because they're you know this is not their thing so it's interesting when you think about different professors you know some of them i don't not only i don't remember their name but the content is just you know, <laughs> like, like hopefully you'll never hear about it, but but biology like, there's nothing i remember from <laughs> i mean this is except maybe i don't know <laughs> nothing can about that science but almost everything you taught us i remember because it was a content and there was passion behind it and I think they were very relatable to the life situation that I envision in my future mm -hmm. and if you think about you know the, the pig farming maybe I remember way less about it because it's not applicable but the hard part it feels like that you have the entire 60 in PI situation 60 people class that you have to deliver to and they have to pass the grade so it'd be a really tough thing to do because in the market in business I just say well it's not for you so let's move on to those that really need it mm, yeah right right well, but you know, there is some of that. I mean, not everybody who comes through a veterinary school class is gonna see patients with heart disease. I like to think that there are similarities though. There are, there are elements in common that can always be tapped into. I mean, there's a reason that veterinary students are in a vet school class, the same way there would be reasons for somebody to be talking to you as an entrepreneur. I mean, there's gonna be a lowest common denominator. And so I enjoy speaking to that. I like to think that if somebody talks to me and I feel like they really mean it, like if they actually believe in what they're saying, I feel that that comes across. That makes a huge difference. When I was a young veterinarian, holy moly, I'd sort of say things tentatively. And sometimes, you know, I can remember being in, in an exam room with a, an animal patient and explaining to the client, you know, we should do this and this. And then I would say something like, we can also do blood work if you like. As if, you know, somebody who went to the vet would know whether you should do blood work. It's the vet's job. And I'm sure I look back and it probably sounded like, you know, would you like fries with that? <laughs> like it's just the most abysmal kind of lack of understanding. So I guess I feel like if there's an understanding of what holds everybody together in a particular situation, like why, why are my students there? You know, why do they come here? Then speaking to that, I think grounds like the, the other material. And you can really tell that if somebody needs it. So now I just say, you know what? I think we should do blood work. So that sounds more like there's a reason for doing it. Yeah, it's so interesting. One of the, um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about being involved in several startups. I sold my last one in January of last year. The thing that I really loved about it is the startup energy. So there's this thing and, you know, a new fresh company. It's kind of like you pack a bunch of people in, in a canoe and you figure out how to all row in the same direction. Mm. The thing that I really enjoy about startup culture or startup companies is the young energy that comes from being surrounded by a bunch of young people that are trying to figure things out. Some of them that you know. And, you know, there's a blend of kind of admiration and also questioning that comes with young people. And I really like it. I think it's taught me to be a better business person because I, I question and I listen more than I would have. And I would be really interested to hear from your perspective what it's like to be surrounded by young, passionate people day in and day out. It must be infectious and must keep you young. I mean, there's no other way to put it that I can think of. It's a privilege because exactly what you described, that pure motivation, that, that desire, that just kind of gut level, you know, wanting to do the right thing is there all the time. And so who could ask for anything better? Now that said, I mean, I remember being that person and having all the best, you know, goodwill in the world, but I didn't know anything. I mean, um, nothing practical and you know, probably not enough factual. And so that creative energy also carries with it like not knowing how necessarily how to apply it or thinking of applying it in a certain way where I know that I've seen that not work well. And so I want to say, well, maybe we can try this other way or be careful because doing it your way might lead to, to these problems. 
I hear what you're saying, and I really do think it's a balance. You know, there's the yin and the yang. The yin is the motivation, and I think also the questioning that's not bound by like the everyday stuff that now is my norm. You know, when somebody says, "What about this?" or you know, "Squirrel," like just the the thing that's that's out of the box. Like, geez, maybe that's really good. But the yang to that yin is of trying to rein it in or trying to offer direction in a way that's not dictatorial or or just to have it spin well rather than than you know my way or or whatever it's so interesting because like like you've done ivan brought up examples with your child i just have them spewing out of me you know like have these two two wonderful children that i wish i could figure out a way to harness their energy because i'd be able to go 24 hours a day seven days <laughs> But but it's often misdirected or in this direction or that direction or running towards the river or the pool or the road, you know, and uh, yeah. fine. <laughs> so, yeah. so I wanted to maybe wrap up with sort of a inspirational and, and, and the visionary question on to the visionary students. Because what, what I found is what happened to me after vet school and the direction that I went into was so interesting and I'm so blessed to be in veterinary medicine because I could take any direction. So I've done, you know, technology startup, I worked as a vet, I worked in emergencies, so many different directions you can take. Should we have more sort of entrepreneurial training or maybe not training, but figure out who fits more into that mind while we're in vet school? Does PI, the UPI do that more, finding out entrepreneurial? Because, you know, we had John Tate, teach us business and in one week he scared me rather than inspired me to do any because I realized I don't know nothing about it uh, and then figured out later so is there a direction where you think that vet education should be taking more to bring this out of people and, and create people like yourself with sort of multi-directional aspirations after school so that's so interesting you should say that I mean I think the answer is yes but I think of it more as for me as yes in terms of freedom as in knowing that those opportunities exist and allowing them to blossom, right? Rather than um, forcing everyone to take them. I know when I was a veterinary student, we had a little bit of kind of business training, you might say, and it just came across as really dry. To me, it was actually an obstacle. You know, my idealism was very clear about what I wanted to do, which was to help animals in need. And the whole concept of veterinary medicine as a business was unappealing. It actually seemed, I'm going to say pejorative things, you know, like it seemed uh, kind of cheap or profiteering or whatever. And so I wanted nothing to do with it. But that's because I wasn't ready for that aspect at that time. I didn't understand that at some point I might be responsible for the livelihood of people I work with who might depend on a paycheck or whatever. And so I'll, I'll speak to my own perspective. If I had to be a student again, I think what I would benefit from was just knowing that this exists, you know, that there are opportunities, that it doesn't get suppressed actively, but just by neglect. I think sometimes we, we suppress certain aspects of what we teach by neglect. So I agree with you that there is room for that. And that is being incorporated more at different levels, some minor, uh, some more significant. So for example, you might remember clinical conference is the seminar that fourth year students have to present to the entire school. You have 12 minutes to do it. And clinical conference now has to include how much did uh, the bill come to, what were the financial aspects that were discussed with the owner and so on, so that that doesn't get suppressed by neglect. But that's just a minor example. There's still aspects of formal business teaching and entrepreneurial, I think, not specifically. I would say, for example, I know that Cornell had a, the Cornell Vet School had a hackathon, you know, and just kind of throw people together and see what they come up with. And I vaguely want to say that we had something similar, but not a recurring thing that I know of. So I think there would be room for that. And at the same time, veterinary students are already, you know, stretched wildly thin. I think one of the things that's really important for a, a good veterinarian is to find some kind of balance that works for him or her. And uh, I'm a hypocrite to talk about that because I, I don't know what that balance is. But I know that it's a wise thing to look for. We're always expecting so much of ourselves. And to be able to say, like, you know what? I forgive myself for having screwed this up or not living up to this thing or not completing what I meant to complete. This isn't like a, a rising call for being slackers. It's just that 
we do often take on more than we can maybe humanly complete. So a very convoluted answer to your question that I think says there is room for that, but I don't know that pushing more of it into the curriculum is necessarily the answer, but perhaps more having folks like the two of you who are involved in sharing that passion. I mean, I think that can come across in a minute, just explaining what it is that turned your crank and that made you go from where you started out to where you are now. That kind of thing can resonate immediately with a couple of people and that transforms their careers. So, so I, I, I like that kind of opportunity. It's been so much fun to talk to you. You know, and I've got one more question. You know, one of the things that I want to do is give people resources or things that they can take away from our conversations. Last advice, anything to read, anything that you would put in your former students' hands that maybe you didn't know of when, when they were around the vet school, hmm. like this old guy next to me. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, you know, boy, I mean, this isn't going to be very original, but it's honest. The first time I read Simon Sinek's Start With Why, I just, like, my jaw dropped, and, you know, I read it again, and, uh, and I liked it because it's quite universal. I don't think it is about entrepreneurship, certainly not about, about academia or anything else. That, yeah, to me, is, uh, is something that spoke to me. That's, that's an exceptional book, I love it, and, yeah. Yeah, we were watching that YouTube video, I think, in a car somewhere just a little while ago. Yeah. Um, where, can we, where can we find you online or where can our listeners, you know, engage with you? My presence is mostly in the flesh with both feet at the University of Prince Edward Island. But my profiles would be uh, on Amazon with the textbooks on the Timeless Veterinary Systems website for the Drug Index. Mm-hmm.